어, 기준 안녕하세요. 아, 네. 어, 10시 30분, it's 10.30 right now. So uh, I will uh, start the class. Um, today we have uh, another invited speaker and he will be uh, lecturing on online learning, uh, in particular, uh, how to optimize this online learning algorithm. I know that uh, uh, I gave a, a very brief introduction uh, on, on online learning, uh, but it's been a little, been two weeks or three weeks. So um, I think uh, our invited speaker will probably review that material uh, very quickly once more. And uh, then we'll uh, go on and uh, talk about uh, new topics. Uh, related to online learning and uh, in particular uh, optimization. Okay, I'd just like to just say that the, uh, the paper list for the project is uploaded and uh, you have to select, I think, uh, two papers uh, for review. And uh, what you have to do is to um, summarize the paper uh, and also uh, confirm the experimental results in the paper. Okay, that is uh, your task. Okay, and uh, you are required to submit a video, a short video of the paper, summarizing the paper, and also later on uh, just a, a report. Um, okay, so I've looked at the list today, and I think only 24 people have uh, uh, selected the papers, and there are uh, 30, 32 or 33 people uh, taking this course. Okay, so um, go and do that. Um, and I've also updated the uh, uh, syllabus, and uh, it was as I said, uh, we will have uh, various uh, invited speakers to talk about various applications. We had uh, two, uh, three invites, okay, including uh, the person who wrote it. And uh, so uh, please do that. Uh, and today, let me just uh, introduce our speaker. Uh, Yun Chari. Uh, his probably uh, focus is uh, currently on optimization. He's, I think he's probably the uh, leading expert right now, in, definitely in Korea and uh, probably worldwide. And uh, he's also a graduate of uh, KAIST. And um, he did uh, Europe before he went abroad. So he spent a year in my lab uh, doing various projects. And uh, so, and uh, he went to Stanford uh, to study under a very, very famous uh, uh, professor. And then later on, he went to MIT to uh, do uh, other stuff, okay? So uh, let's welcome our invited speaker, Yun Chari. He's, uh, uh, I should say, he's part of uh, uh, the AI graduate school uh, in our uh, in our school. So, yeah. so let's welcome him uh, with a quick applause. Um, all right, thank you very much for the uh, warm introduction. Uh, just by, uh, Michael, can stay again? Just... Um, Oh, no, so, do you all hear me? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, um, sorry about this. Sorry about this. Uh, what is the Um, Okay, so uh, I'm 
그래서 그리고 그저그 스크린 셰어를 해야 되는데 권한이 없다고 그러거든요. 잠깐만요. 그... 소스 웨이 미넷. 소리가 좀잘안 들려요. 잠깐만요. 아, 그러세요? 네, 네. 잠깐만요. 제가 음 요거 좀 하고 와 준엽이 who's what's what's wrong with this? Oh, okay. So 소리가 이거를 좀더 어, 마이크가 없지 여기서 그러니까 여기 다 들리 한번 얘기 한번 해볼래요? 어 혹시 들리시나요? 들리나요? <웃음> 하나 문제 없어요? 네. 들립니다. 네, 혹시 또 뭐? 아 예, 어, 아그 스크린 쉐어링을 해야 되는데 그 퍼미션이 없다 그래가지고 저를 호스트로 좀 만들어줄 수 있나요? 저기 저 아, 지금 아, 저 아, 얼굴 그거 해야 돼요. 그잘 썼어요. 왜 이것도 네. 얼굴 나오는 거 얼굴 나오는 거 말고 안 나오는 애로 좀 호스트로 만들어줄 수 있, 있을까요? 잠깐만요. 이거 어떻게 하는지 나 그걸 몰라서 어 잠깐만. 파티스펀스에 그, 제가 아마 둘이 있을 텐데 잠깐만요 제가 그 중에서 네네네 지금 카메라 꺼, 카메라 꺼진 애를 호스트로 만들어 주시면 될것 같습니다. 알았어. 어 이게 이 혹시 좀 도와줄 수 있어요? 주... 저기는 예 네. 이게 왜 애플 안 쓰지? 어 쓰고 쓰세요? 뭐, 다시. 아 그러니까 지금 그 스크린샷 그 권한을 줘야 되는데 일단 줌에 지금 안 들어가가지고 이게 아니 줌이 계속 여기가 화면 이 저기 화면 이 좀. 아 그래요? 저기, 그러면 어떻게 어떻게 저기, 하면 쓰세요? 어 무슨 무슨 거냐 여기서 이제 보는 거라는 주소. 네네 주주고요. 네. 그리고 그 다음에 어 스크린샷. 아 됐습니다. 됐나요? 한번 스크린샷 해보면은 어... 네 지금 됐습니다. 네네. 오케이. Okay. Right. Um. Sorry for the technical um uh, problems. So that this actually is my fault because I um I wasn't able to make it uh in person um because my office is in Seoul campus. Uh, anyhow um. Uh, thank you very much for the warm introduction. Uh, so it's a great honor and, and pleasure actually, because uh, so uh, as I, as Professor Yu said, I did a um, URP um, in his lab and spent like one one uh, one year before doing uh, KAIST for graduate studies. Uh, and uh, what's 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 very special about this moment is that uh, exactly one uh, like ten years ago, I was sitting in the classroom for E five uh, five thirty one. Uh, as a student, and then, <laughs> and I'm and I'm I'm now giving a guest lecture, which is which uh, very means a lot to me. So it's a very special moment. Anyhow, so today uh, I'm going to talk about um, the online learning and online complex optimization, and this actually links to the the previous lectures that Professor Yu gave uh, about online learning. So today we'll be uh, briefly um, we'll be just briefly reviewing uh, what you have already covered, I guess. Uh, but um, perhaps a little more details. And then uh, next time, I'm going to do a little bit more fun things, uh, such as online comics, of online uh, gradient descent, online mirror descent, these things. All right. So um, let me just briefly start with the, uh, by just assuming that you have forgotten everything about online learning, uh, just to give you a little, little bit of overview and uh, introduction to this entire topic. All right. So uh, in the statistical learning theory class, you might have been um, previously studying mostly supervised learning problems, right? And these supervised learning problems um, are mostly fo focusing on uh, offline uh, or stochastic and, and stochastic setting. What I mean by so offline and stochastic setting, I mean that um, you have an underlying distribution. So you assume that you have a underlying distribution uh, that which, which you don't know actually. 
And your data actually comes from this underlying data distribution. And since you don't know the under, underlying distribution, you instead consider a data set of IID samples from the same data distribution, right? So this is what I mean by stochastic because you we assume a probability distribution of data, right? And then you, you just assume that um, your data points are just IID samples from the same distribution. And what I mean by offline is you only, you consider a chunk of data samples, right? You, you have a finite number of data points um, and, and you collect those and then do some optimization and learning, right? So that's what I mean by offline. And sometimes also people say this as a batch setting, right? So it's a, so we have a batch of data and then try to do some learning out of it. But uh, in, in online learning, um, things are a little differ, different from this conventional supervised learning setting in um, at least two different ways, All right? So in online learning, we wanna solve some somewhat different type of um, learning problem uh, with two key differences. First of all, the batch or offline setting is now converted to the online setting, okay? So learning, um, instead of collecting the data, uh, collecting n finite number of data, and then you just do something, um, you actually do uh, this learning in an online fashion. So what I mean by online fashion is, you, you, you have to keep learning uh, in the presence of a continuous influx of information. Uh, sorry for the bad handwriting. Influx. Okay, so your inf the, there there are some some information get, that gets revealed to your to the to the learner uh, in a continuous manner, and and the learning proceeds by round and round, right? by uh, in a round uh, in a round fashion. And and more importantly, the performance is, performance is measured uh, throughout the entire course of training, not at the end of training. The entire course of training, not the end of training. So in in case of offline learning, offline learning. So you uh, you assume that you have collected all the training data points, and then uh, what actually matter is uh, your your performance at the end of training, right? So you, you train a neural network, for example, and what, what actually matters is the, is the final performance that you get at the end of training, not the, like the, in, like, not uh, in, at the um, like middle epochs of the training, right? However, what, 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 what's different from, um, uh, what, what's different about online learning is you have a con continuous uh, information, the continuous influx information, you're, you're, data actually gets added to uh, added to you uh, continuously and your performance of your learner learner uh, has to has to be as good as possible even um, during your training okay? so that's the one difference of online learning and the other is uh, you no longer assume that you're in the stochastic setting where your data is, an IID sample of a fixed distribution. Instead, you have to be able to deal with adversarial um, data. Okay. Okay. So this point, this means that the data is uh, not necessarily chosen IID, and it could actually be generated by an adversarial uh, nature. Let's say. So in the online online learning setup, the learner has to interact with nature, and this nature can be uh, adversarial, okay? uh, meaning that the, the the nature is trying to screw screw up your learning algorithm so that you had so, so that the learning algorithm suffers um, high loss. Okay, so I'll be uh, clearer about this adversarial nature uh, in a minute. All right, so this is the definition of the concrete online learning setup, which you might have seen already, but um, I'm gonna give you a little, a little bit of um, recap. So in the online learning setup, as I said, um, learn, it, the learning actually proceeds in um, P different steps. So um, we, uh, the interaction happens once uh, every, in every step, 
Uh, and we repeat this process in large T steps. And each and, and in, and in each of the steps, the learner uh, receives the input xt from the nature. Okay. So in the nature, from the nature, the learner receives an input, let's say it's x1. And then uh, for the input, um, learner uh, has to make a prediction and output the prediction and send it to the nature. So let's say this is PT. So given X1, the learner makes the prediction P1 okay, about the label. Uh, and, and then the, the nature reveals the true label. Why? So in this case, um, the, the, the nature will actually let the learner know the true label Y1. And based on the discrepancy between uh, the PT and YT, the learner suffers some loss. So first the loss, uh, which can be written as L of PT comma YT, right? So this is how a single step of online learning uh, is performed. And we, we, we just, as I said, we repeat this process for um, a large T times. Okay. So uh, in the next round, the nature will give you, give the learner x2, and the learner will have to make a prediction p2, and uh, the true output to the true label y2 is revealed, so on and so forth. We repeat this process until we get to large t. So this is how the online learning is performed. It's an interaction between nature and learner. Uh, let me actually give you some example. Uh, um, so. This example particularly is uh, a good example that that um, shows the adversarial nature of the uh, adversarial um, um, characteristic of the nature that we're, we're that we're talking about. So, in the spam filter example, um, we have uh, the learner as our um, like email uh, like email service provider, but the nature is. Uh, so, so many be bad people that sends out spam spam mails in the um, worldwide. Okay, so so in the spam filter example, let's say xt is something about the email. Okay, and given this email, the learner actually has to predict whether this is a, a spam mail or not a spam mail. Okay, uh, so in the classical setup of spam filter, uh, what people has to be, people used to do is um, they formed a zero one vector. Um, this is not a one half vector, so it's a one zero one vector of d dimension, where d is the size of the vocabulary um, that actually indicates the presence or absence of certain words. Okay, so for example, for example, if there's the uh, if there's a word jackpot included in the in the mail, then this would, would be a very strong indicator, right? Strong, strong indicator that this email would be possibly be possibly be a spam mail, right? So this is how uh, people used to do uh, the spam filtering before transformers, let's say. Okay, so this is our, our input XT. And Y key or P key, um, they must be some binary predictions or labels, uh, whether this spam, this email XT would be a spam or not spam. Okay. And the loss function that the learner has to suffer is whether uh, the prediction was correct, right? So this can be written as a one, a zero one loss where uh, the loss value is one if PT is not equal to YT and the loss value is zero if YT uh, is actually equal to YT, uh, PT, okay? So in this scenario, um, the, the nature uh, or the many, uh, many senders of email worldwide will actually give the learner XT, which is um, an email, okay? And then learner has to make a prediction that, oh, this, this will be a spam or this, this must not be a spam, okay? And then the nature will reveal actually that uh, there is this one and was a spam or not a spam, and then and then the learner will actually uh, will 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 suffer the loss based on the correctness of the prediction. 
And what's adverse, adversarial about this setting is, um, even if the learner learns, learns to, to, um, to classify the filter and classify the spam or, or non-spam emails, the nature will, could actually um, change the way it behaves, right? To, um, to, 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 to fool the learner um, so that the learner, the, the previous role that was learned by the learner becomes useless. Right, so that's how the um, that's why what, what I mean by uh, this adversarial nature. Okay? So nature could actually do uh, behave in an adversarial way to make the learner suffer as much loss as possible. Okay, so given this setup, the performance of a learner is uh, evaluated by something called the regret. So this is a little different from. Uh, the empirical risk or population risk that you might have talked about in this, uh, the standard uh, offline stuff. So the regret is uh, this cumulative loss. Sorry about that. Cumul the cumulative loss, the learners of first, uh, but not the, the exact cum cumulative loss itself, but we have to compare with some expert. So what I mean by this, in, in addition to the best expert will be clear. Mm -hmm. So we're, so in order to, um, in order to calculate the, the, the regret, we need to actually come up with a, so the set of experts, which I'll call the hypothesis class. So you're given a hypothesis class and this hypothesis class is a set of, um, it's a collection of predictors. It's a collection of the functions called the predictors, H, which maps X into Y. So it's, it, it itself is a, um, is a, is a the function that makes a prediction given input. Right. So given an input, it makes a prediction about the label. Okay. And so the regret, which is a relative measure of a learner with respect to a predictor or hypothesis, H is given as the difference between the cumulative loss of the learner and the reference hypothesis H. Okay. Let me spell out the definition. So regret, uh, with respect to H is given as the difference between the sum um, over all the time steps of the loss the, the learner suffers. This is the law, this is the loss that is suffered by the law, a learner. And this is the um, loss that is suffered by the hypothesis. Yeah. So the regret actually. Uh, indicates how well the learner behaves com in comparison to a given fixed hypothesis or expert H. Okay. Usually the expert does a good job of predicting something. So usually the learner, uh, the regret would be a positive number. And um, uh, since we're talking about the hypothesis class H, we, we're actually interested in um, the performance of our learner in comparison to the best expert that is that can be uh, that that is present in the hypothesis class. Okay, so the regret with respect to the entire hypothesis class H uh, is uh, naturally given as the maximum of the regret among the hypotheses in the class. So this is the the regret. So yeah. So this uh, this, this is the 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 sum of the loss that it uh, the our learner suffers. So the best thing is that uh, the the regret is small, right? So usually what we want to do is we want to show that for all t and the 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 incoming pairs of x and x and y, um, the regret. Uh, with respect to the entire hypothesis class is upper bounded by something. And this something 
can be the roughly written as B of H and T. And this bound, this upper bound, um, ideally should grow sublinearly. So what I mean by sublinearly is that it's, it grows small, uh, it grows, grows slower than a linear rate. So in terms of, so um, the growth of this bound uh, is slower than T, uh, uh, which in terms of the, the, the big O, a small, small notation, um, well, we can write this as little O of T. Okay. So what happens if the regret is little O of T? Uh, it, this means that the average regret, for example, will actually go, go to zero. Okay, so this is this means that uh, our learner is doing a good job because we're given two uh, we're given t examples, and uh, but the regret is uh, little o of t, so it grows slower than t. So uh, in the long run, the average regret that the learner suffers per example will actually go to zero. And uh, importantly, uh, as I said. This has to hold for all t and all the inputs x t uh, x one y one through x t y t. Okay, so we want this hold to we want this to hold for any um, input sequences or data, um, and even especially especially even when the nature chooses these y i's in an adversarial way. Okay. So this um, adversarial nature actually provides us with some a bit of challenge in implementing a, a learner that has sublinear regret. Okay, so this, which is unlike the stochastic setting, where uh, more data with more data we have a better um, estimate of the data distribution and we can do a better job with our learner. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna. Um, this is probably uh, covered in prof Professor Yu's class, but I'm gonna briefly recap that this adversarial nature could, could be really, really powerful, powerful so that this online learning could be impossible in some cases, uh, unless we make some uh, good assumptions on the learning mechanism and the nature, All right? So I'm gonna show you some impossibility result. So we let's consider a binary classification problem with fully deterministic learner. Okay, then um, let's say whenever the, the learner makes some prediction, uh, PT, which is one of uh, either plus one or minus one for a given XT, the nature actually could um, could choose um, the, their, the, the, the pairs X1, Y1 and XT, YT in a way that the yt is always in the negative sign of pt, okay? So the nature could actually uh, formulate some, some sequence of examples that way if you're given a fully determ deterministic learner and make the learner uh, suffer the loss of one every time. So every time the learner actually gets the wrong label, so it, it suffers the loss of one in every time step. So this means that the cumulative loss suffered by um, the learner would exactly be large t. Okay. So let, let me actually um, try to uh, calculate uh, the regret of this um, bad, this poor learner. Uh, so we, let's, let's consider a very simple hypothesis class. Uh, which consists of two predictors. So our large H is a collection of two predictors, H plus one, H minus one. Our H subgroup Y always predicts Y. So this predictor always predicts plus one. So this, and this predictor always predicts minus one, okay? 
So in this case, uh, since we're dealing with a binary classification with zero and loss, uh, if you add uh, the loss suffered by H plus one and H minus one, they always have to sum to one, right? Yeah. And so this always holds for every time step. So this means that uh, at least one of these hypotheses, um, they at least one of them actually satisfies that uh, it, it's cumulative, cumulative loss is less than or equal to yeah, T over two. Right? So this means that uh, the regret the learner suffers with respect to this hypothesis class, very simple hypothesis class, is at least uh, T minus T over two, where does T come from the learner's cumulative uh, loss, and this minus T over two comes from, um, yeah, the, ex the existence of at least one hypothesis with less than or equal to T over two uh, cumulative loss. So the regret is at least T over two, which is a bad news, right? So this this prevent this shows that whatever you do uh, with the what how in in any for any deterministic learner that we choose, um, there is a way that the, the the nature actually cooks up the examples uh, so that the regret is at least linear uh, in in terms of t. So in this case, uh, we can show we can see that this adversarial nature is too powerful for us to do something meaningful. There, there's no um, online learning algorithm that that achieves a sublinear regret bound. Right? So maybe we're we're uh, we're letting the nature to be too powerful. So we may we, then this means that for online learning to be meaningful or for us to or, or the, the online learning to be possible, uh, we make to we have to make some assumptions. Okay. And one possible assumption, which I believe you uh, have already seen, one possible assumption uh, that makes the online learning work is something called the realizability. So realizability uh, is an assumption that requires that there exists a hypothesis H star inside our hypothesis class, such that this hypothesis is actually the true answer. Okay. So why T is always equal to the prediction by H star. Okay. So in this case, uh, we can actually show that um, for, a hyp for a finite hypothesis class, um, the regret can be shown to be um, a constant in terms of the number, in terms of T, okay? But um, as you can see, uh, this assumption of realizability is perhaps too strong uh, in most cases, okay? So in in the in the coming up um, um, uh, pages, uh, maybe in two or 30, 20 or 30 minutes, I'm gonna talk about another way to um, bypass this impossibility result by making another assumption, a different assumption, which is much weaker um, on the adversarial nature. Okay. okay, that was a brief recap of perhaps the section one of the online learning book that we've been that you have been um, seeing with Professor Yu. And let me now move on to a very interesting uh, setup which is called the online convex optimization. Okay, so I've been talking about this online learning, but why talk about another uh, setup, which is called the uh, online convex optimization. So the motivation for talking about this, um, the problem setup is that the many online learning problems can actually be reduced uh, to something called the online convex optimization problem. or I'll abbreviate this as OCO problems, okay? So the OCO uh, provide, provides a very powerful uh, framework that allows us to unify 
um, unify the analysis of many online learning algorithms. Okay, so studying studying the OCO framework and providing some uh, proving some um, some theorem can actually be applied to many different uh, online learning um, instances. Also, uh, by convexification, which I'll talk about a little more detail later. Convexification. So, yeah, so by the convexification technique, one can actually also bypass the impossible, impossibility result that we just talked about, namely the regret being at least, sub, at least linear. All right, and, and before I uh, move on to formally define the framework of online convex optimization, uh, I'm gonna give you a brief recap of very important definitions that arise that, that will be very useful in uh, the discussion for today and the next lecture. So, um, so uh, just to give you a reminder, uh, we say that a set S is a call the convex set if the following implication holds. So U, if there is any U and W inside the set, then uh, for any lambda uh, between zero and one, this the lambda U times one minus lambda W, this has this this point has also this also has to be in the set S. So pictorially, this is easier to understand. So if you have U and V, now uh, U and W right here, then for the the points that correspond to this, for um for the Z one corresponds to the line segment connecting U and W. Okay. So the convexity requirement is that if you have two points, then the line segment could connecting these two points must be fully inside the set also, okay? So this means that, uh, so the, in this example, the set is convex because if you choose any two points, then the line segment between these two points are like contained entirely in the set. And what is an example of non-convex set? So this, not, this, is, this, con this set is non-convex because if you choose U and W this way, and then the, if and draw the line segment right this, then there is a certain part of the segment that does not stay in the set. So this is an, one example of non-convex set or not convex. Okay. So this that, that was the definition of the convex set. And the next definition is very important. Uh, this is a convex functions. So yeah. I'm pretty sure many of you are really familiar with convex, the convexity, okay? So we say that a, a function f that maps a convex set or a domain s uh, to the real number, so it's a, it's a function from s to r, is convex if um, the f evaluated at lambda u plus one minus lambda w is always less than or equal to lambda times f of u plus one minus lambda times f of w. For all u and w inside the set S and lambda between zero and one. So this definition is also um, easier to understand if you draw some pictures. So you have a function like this, and this is, u, this is your u, and this is your W, okay? So what, I, what I'm doing with, in this uh, inequality is comparing the function value um, evaluated at uh, some, somewhere in between these two, these two points versus a line segment that, uh, that connects the, the two different points in, on the graph, okay? So if you, if you connect the two points on the graph of the function, uh, the, the requirement of convexity is that the line segment, uh, this red line segment is always uh, below, uh, sorry, it's always above um, the function value, the, the graph of the function, okay? So that's the, the crucial definition 
the crucial requirement uh, that the um, that they, the the complexity definition imposes. So you can see that uh, since any of the line segments are actually be actually above um, the graph of the function, you can see what well, see that this this function is convex, and convexity is not restricted to differentiable functions. So this is one example of ReLU. Yeah, which is a maximum of t comma zero. So th although there's a dif non differentiability at zero, uh, we can actually check from the definition that this is indeed also a convex function. But you can surely see that this is a non convex function because if you uh, choose two, di two different points like this and draw lines, then the line segment is actually below the graph of the function. Okay, so this is the I think it's law of convection. Okay. Okay. And since um, convexity is a very important notion, um, it, it has been very heavily studied. There's a there's a, a, a very large literature on um, convex optimization where we want to find the minimum of uh, minimum about minimum point uh, of convex functions, and there are also a very diverse, uh, let's say, um, equivalent definitions of the convexity. And I'm, not, I'm gonna talk about one of this equivalent definition, which will be useful in the next lecture. All right, so the convex a function is convex if and only if for all points w in the domain of the function s, um, there exists at least one vector z such that the f of u, the u is some 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 other um, point in the domain. F of u is always lower bounded by f of w plus uh, the inner product between this this vector z and u minus w, and this has to hold for all u in the domain s. So this is an equivalent definition of the convexity. So this is an if and only if. So what this one actually says is there, so for any, if you choose any reference point W, uh, there's a way uh, of linearly approximating um, the function F so that this, this linear approximation actually gives a global, global lower bound for the entire function. So for example, uh, if you choose the W like this, okay, and choose the vector, uh, in, in this case, the vector is a single uh, scalar. So let's say the vector Z is uh, the slope of the function. Then if you, uh, the, if you try to draw the graph of the uh, right-hand side, then this one actually becomes a uh, linear approximation with respect to the, the point W which gives us a global lower bound of the entire convex function. Okay, so such, such, uh, such vector Z are called the subgradients of the function um, F at W. And the collection of all the subgradient values is, um, is denoted as this partial F of W, okay? So this is the collection of all the Z's inside uh, the RD, such that this inequality holds for all U, okay? So let me give you some example. So if, um, so since consider something, a function that looks like a ReLU function, but the kink right here is at um, X equal to one. So there are many options for this subgradient value. So for example, you can actually choose Z to be just equal to zero. And in which case the right-hand side would look like this, okay? Or that you can actually choose Z to be one, which in which case the right-hand the right, the right -hand side will look like this, okay? Sorry, sorry for the bad drawing. So this is this has to perfectly coincide. 
but uh, any value between zero and one will actually work and provide a global global lower bound for um, the entire function uh, the, uh, drawn in blue, although it is, yeah, uh, it's kind of hidden. So the uh, the the, sub, the 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 set of the subgradients can be written as the entire interval from zero to one, close interval from zero to one. And one can actually also notice that if f is a differentiable function, or if uh, it's a sorry, if if f is differentiable at W, which means that there e exists a gradient, then the set of subgradients evaluated at W is a singleton that only contains the, the gradient value. Okay, so you can view this subgradient as the um, as a generalization of gradients. So, for example, if you have um, if you consider the W uh, at this point uh, right here as the reference point, the only uh, Z that provides the global lower bound will be actually one. Okay. There's a, the subgradient set will be a single term with, uh, so if you have this w, w, let's say, so if you have this W prime, then the subgradient set will be just one. Okay, so that's, that was subgradient. So we're now, I think, ready for uh, the formal definition of online convex optimization. So given these convex convexity definitions in mind, we can actually define uh, the online convex optimization framework. So this is actually very simple uh, and very closely related to online learning, uh, as you'll, you'll be able to see. So we're given a convex set S, then, uh, as, as in the case of online learning, uh, this online convex optimization also proceeds in multiple steps, the total large T steps. And uh, in this case, the learner actually chooses some WT, which is a D dimensional vector chosen from a convex set S, okay? And then the learner receives a convex loss. The loss has to, con has to be convex, FT. Okay, the FT is a convex function that maps S to a real number. And then the loss that the learner suffers is this FT evaluated at WT, our prediction. Okay, so we can actually contrast, compare and contrast this uh, interaction between the learner and the nature um, uh, with the, the, the interaction that happened in online learning. In, in online learning, uh, the nature actually gives the learner xt and the learner makes a prediction pt and the nature gives us yt, okay? And there's a certain uh, function that L that gives us the loss function, okay? So we're actually a little different here, right? So uh, in, in the case of online convex optimization, the loss and x, y, they're all captured in the convex loss f of t. And the prediction um, uh, now amounts to the wt that the learner chooses, okay? So this is uh, quite related, but slightly different. But we're gonna, we're gonna see that uh, this many of the online learning, um, the problems can be actually formulated into this online convex optimization uh, problem, okay? So that the solving the online convex optimization well actually leads to a good online learning um, algorithm. All right. So um, as the as the similar formulation suggests, the performance is also um, um, measured in a very similar manner. The performance measure is also the regret, as in the case of online learning. Okay. So for some reference point U um, that is a member of uh, large U, uh, this, this is a, set, a subset of RD, um, which could be actually different from the convex set S, okay? So the regret uh, with respect to the vector U 
is given as uh, the same way. So actually the same way. This is the cumulative loss suffered by the learner. And this is the cumulative loss suffered by the reference factor U. So the, 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 the difference between the cumulative loss suffered by the learner and the, um, the reference vector U or the hypothesis U. So it's essentially the same definition as the regret that you've seen in online learning. And uh, since the U, uh, so, so this regret is for a single reference vector, we want to also define the regret with respect to a, um, this entire set of different hypotheses or the vectors. So the, the, the regret with respect to the large U is yeah, um, naturally defined as the maximum of the uh, regret of small U, the individual vectors U. And in many cases, we can actually set U equal to the set S, the convex set S that we saw in the formulation, okay? But not, this is not always the case. But in most cases, we can, we can treat U as the same as the S. Okay. So as I briefly alluded earlier, this online learning problems can be reduced to online complex optimization problems in a way that achieving this low regret for online complex optimization actually implies achieving low regret for online learning. Okay, let me give you some concrete examples right now. All right, so the first example is perhaps the, the best suited for the online complex optimization um, uh, formula, for the formulation. So this is the online linear regression. We want to solve the linear regression problem. It's a very, com a very um, uh, classical topic but in an online setup. The, so in, in the online learning case, the, the linear regressions, uh, the loss function for the linear regression is naturally the squared loss. Um, this, uh, the squared discrepancy between our prediction PT and the true label YT, okay? So let, let me actually describe how we can solve this online linear regression by the help of a good online convex optimization solver, okay? So um, for, of course, this uh, the proceeds in uh, t different time steps. So the online learner um, receives xt from the nature. This is uh, um, the input that is given by the nature. And what online learner actually does for online convex optimization solver uh, is it asks the OCO algorithm for a weight vector, wt, that, is, that, is, that comes from rd. And uh, out of this weight vector given by the OCEO algorithm, the online learner makes a prediction PT um, simply as the weight vector and multiplied with XT. So inner product between this WT given by the OCEO and XT, our current input. And this is our prediction PT, and we send it to uh, the nature. And then uh, the nature actually uh, receives this PT and also gives the true label to the online learner. Okay, so nature gives us the YT, uh, from which we know that uh, we know the regret, uh, we know the loss that we, we suffer in this uh, current time step. And, and so, and also the OCO in the OCO framework, uh, the nature should actually give us a function, a convex function FT, right? Because uh, in OCO, the, the learner makes a prediction about the weight factor WT and receives a convex function to uh, FT, right? So the online learner actually gives FT, which is defined as, uh, this is a function of W defined as W, uh, the inner product of W and XT minus YT squared. So this is the convex function that is given to the online convex optimization solver, okay? So one can actually realize that if the hypothesis class H that we um, considered in defining the regret of the online learner is actually equal to the predictor, 
the, the linear predictors uh, that that is um, that is formed by uh, the vectors u from large u. The u is the uh, the, the set of reference vectors that we uh, use to define the regret of the online complex optimization algorithm. And the tier two regrets for both the online learner and the online complex optim optimization solver, uh, they coincide. Okay. So what this one actually says is, if you have a good algorithm that solves the online complex optimization problem well, then we can do online learning. So because because uh, the the performance of this online learner um, can, is equivalent to the performance of this online complex optimization solver. So if you have a good solver, if you have a good algorithm that solves OCO well, then we can solve online learning well. So this is how what I mean by reducing online learning problems to online complex optimization problems. Okay. And, but uh, we can actually realize that for this example specifically, the convexity is almost trivially given, right? So the weight set, the convexity of the weight set and the loss function FT, um, there, this is so much, this is so super clear, right? But there are actually some other instances of online learning problems that does not have this inherent uh, convexity. So for, for cases without this inherent convexity, uh, what we do? Well, what should we do to um, convert this into an online complex optimization problem? Or can we can we actually are we actually able to do this? Okay. So for in this cases, if for these cases, we can actually or we, what we can do is we can convexify the problem. Convexify the problem um, to pass this inherently non-convex problem as an OCO problem, okay? So let me give you a very interesting concrete example. So this is, a, this is a problem called the online classification with expert advice. Okay, so in this case, um, we have the experts in our hypothesis class. So this is H1 through HD, okay? D different experts. And for any given input XT, the learner can actually query them. We can ask them, um, uh, what, what do you think is the, is the right answer? Okay. So we can ask for the advice from the, the, the experts, which are given as a form of the prediction made by um, the experts, okay? And the learner can actually decide on their prediction based on these advices. Perhaps we can try to choose the, the best expert out of the D experts and completely rely our prediction on this expert. Or we can actually try to maybe alternate between two different experts uh, that we think are good enough, okay? And uh, let's, for simplicity, let's assume that we're doing some binary class classification with zero one loss. So whenever our prediction is not correct, we suffer a loss of one. And whenever the, the prediction is correct, the loss is zero. Okay, so in this case, actually, the loss function, which is a zero one loss, and the set of experts, they're both, um, discrete in nature. Okay. So uh, naturally, uh, there's no inherent convexity. That plays a role here. Okay. However, what we can do is we can convexify uh, this problem using randomization. And uh, at where the learner actually maintains a probability distribution of experts, okay, and then make out of probability distribution. 
So this is a way to randomize um, the this expert, uh, the, the, the our, our online learner. And this actually allows us to cast this online learning problem into an list of competition. And also actually uh, the impossibility result that I alluded to earlier. Okay, let me let me describe how we randomize things here. Okay, so for each of the time step, the online learner receives an input xt from the nature, um, which is which is the same, and then the online learner actually asks the online convex uh, optimization solver a weight factor wt as usual, but this time the wt is not just arbitrarily r um, a d dimensional vector, so this has to come from the delta D, where delta D is defined to be the probability simplex. Okay? So this is a collection of Ws in RD, such that each of the components are non-negative. And also, if you sum over the, the, the um, no, D components, they sum to one. Okay, So they actually form a probability distribution. So this is called the probability simplex. OK, so if, uh, so the OCO uh, learner actually gives us a WT, which gives us a probability distribution, right? So the online learner actually samples an index according to this probability distribution given by WT. So we sample an expert, JT, uh, from this probability distribution, WT, and makes the prediction, PT, out of the advice from the chosen expert, okay? So this is a prediction uh, uh, for the input XT of the JTF um, expert. Okay. So we make this prediction this way and then send it to the nature. And the nature actually gives, a, gives us the truly, true output YT, okay? And, and um, the, the online learner now uh, gives some convex function to the OCO learner um, or OCO solver. And we, we uh, the function that, the function FT that is given to OCO is just a linear function. Okay, so this is a linear function, which, which is uh, formulated as an inner product of the input W and something called a ZT, where ZT is the collection of the loss functions suffered by each of the experts given this xt and yt. Okay. Okay, so this is the, how we can formulate this um, classification with expert advice problem into an OCO problem, okay? By uh, randomizing, I meant that we maintain a weight vector, wt, that is sampled from the probability simplex, and this probability simplex is a convex function. So this is surely an online convex uh, optimization problem because we, because we, uh, we chose this S equal to delta D, okay? So the OCO learner has to choose the weight vector from this convex function every time. And we're given the fit as, as feedback, we're, gi we're giving the OCO algorithm uh, a convex function because linear function is convex. Okay, so one, um, there's one important connection to the impossibility result that I uh, mentioned earlier, because here uh, we're now assuming that the yt, the true, true output yt that is given by the, the nature cannot depend on the random draw jt uh, from the distribution um, defined by wt uh, at current time t, okay? Uh, if the yt can depend on the specific random choice of jt, then uh, the nature actually manipulate uh, this true output yt in a way that uh, the online learner has to suffer at least linear regret. Okay. So in, in which case the, uh, the nature would be too powerful. 
Instead, uh, we are now assuming, uh, we are now in, in uh, like almost implicitly assuming that yt cannot depend on uh, the random draw jt. And instead we can, uh, and, and this way we can write, we can realize that um, uh, this F, ft of w can be thought of as the, uh, the expected loss, okay, over the random draws of the experts. And we can also see that achieving this low OCO regret will actually lead to low expected online learning regret. Right. So by randomizing, um, we're now actually we're not actually uh, guaranteed to achieve low online learning regret every time, but we we if you care about the expected regret then the, the expected value of the online learning regret will be low, provided that our OCO algorithm is good enough. So this trick actually applies to many other settings um, outside these um, online classification with expert advice, uh, just provided that the, the, the hypothesis class H is finite. Okay. So one, uh, we, uh, the loss doesn't have to be the zero one loss. It it's it could be just um, if it works for any bounded loss, but the crucial requirement is that you know, the 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 set of experts at the hypothesis class H must be finite, because we work, we have to work with finite dimensional probability distribution. Okay, so for hopefully. Um, um, these two examples have provided you a, a, a good understanding of how this online convex optimization is related to this online learning and why this why solving this online convex optimization problem is important and has any has good implications to solving online learning problems. Okay, so now we'll move to the first uh, solve OCO problem, which is called the follow the leader. Okay. So um, so for this full first CEO, they're very, very simple. Um, we, what we actually try to do is we choose the best uh, W that minimizes uh, the sum of the FIs or FTs that are observed so far. Okay, the sum of convex of FIs are also convex. So we want to solve the, the convex optimization problem at every time step and come up with the best W that works the best so far. Okay. So more concretely, uh, the follow the leader or FTL algorithm is given by this. You choose the WT as a member of the argmin among um, the, the convex set S of the sum of fi's for all the previous time steps. Okay. So you choose the best w for wt, and then um, send it send it to the nature and receive a convex loss, uh, ft, and then we suffer f the loss, which is given as ft evaluated at wt. Okay. So as I said, uh, this actually involves solving this convex optimization problem at every time step, which can be actually quite expensive. But um, we're now, we're going to actually talk about certain special cases that actually comes with some closed form solutions. Okay. So um, with that, uh, we're, let me now just state a lemma and then uh, discuss how, what this lemma actually suggests us to do, okay? So this is a lemma for the FT algorithm. Uh, let W, uh, let F1 from F, uh, from F1 to uh, FT to be any loss functions. And uh, out of this loss functions, we can actually characterize the T1 through WT. 
that is produced by the follow the leader algorithm, FTL algorithm. Okay. So given um, the iterates produced by the FTL algorithm, for and for any reference reference vector u inside S, uh, we can we can actually write the regret of the refer, reference re, regret with, with respect with respect to uh, u, which is defined to be the difference between the cumulative loss of the FTL algorithm and the cumulative loss of u. Uh, this regret is always upper bounded by uh, this quantity, which is the difference of FT for two different values of WT and WT plus one. Okay, okay. so uh, we can now actually, we can actually realize that this right-hand side is completely independent of the U that we chose here, okay? So this applies to any U uh, from our convex set S. So this, as a result, this provides an upper bound for uh, the regret for uh, U, yeah? The regret with respect to the entire set of reference vectors U uh, as long as the, the vector set U is a subset of S. So this is, so in other words, if we can show that the right-hand side here is small, then we should, we can actually show that the regret is small. So regret of the FTL algorithm for, is small. Okay, so in order, in order to um, prove this lemma, we can actually realize that these two parts are redundant. Okay, so we can actually cancel these out. So it suffices to show that um, the sum of FT evaluated at WT plus one is always upper bounded by the sum of T evaluated at U for any U you know, in the domain S. Okay, so it, it suffices to show this statement. And for this, we can actually use uh, mathematical induction on the in the in, in on the inductive hypothesis that I denote using this T prime. Okay, we want to show uh, this theorem, uh, this statement for T uh, T prime equal to one all the way up to T. Okay, so T prime being equal to one serves as the base case, and for the base case, we can actually realize that um, the inequality boils down to F1 evaluated at, at W2 being less than or equal to F1 evaluated at U. And this is trivially true by the definition of W2 because our FTL algorithm chooses W2 to be the argument of W1, okay? So this is, uh, since the W2 is chosen that way, uh, the base case is trivially true. Okay, what about the inductive case? So in the inductive case, we have to uh, given we have to show, uh, given the uh, the inductive hypothesis holds for a minus one, we have to show that the inductive by, uh, hypothesis holds for a. All right. For that purpose, let's suppose that this inequality holds, where we sub some uh, sum to a minus one. Okay. So this is given to us. Uh, now we can actually consider um, adding the same term to the both sides. So we can add F A evaluated at, at W A plus one on both sides. But this should be also true from our induct inductive hypothesis, right? And this holds for any U inside S. So this specifically holds for U being equal to W A plus one. So by just substituting this one into the right-hand side, uh, we now actually get this inequality where the sum uh, of in the right, left-hand side is upper bounded by the, F, uh, the sum of FT values evaluated at WA plus one, okay? But one can now realize that this is also uh, upper bounded by Ft evaluated at any u inside S. Okay, why is this the case? Uh, because 
uh, this is because the of the way we, we chose the W A plus one, because W A plus one is by definition, the arc mean among S, uh, the minimizer of the F T from uh, T equal to one to A. Okay, so this finishes the proof. Okay, so this finishes the inductive step and yeah, we, prove, we, we actually proved that this inequality is true for all t prime equal to one, uh, one to three up to large t. Okay, so this finishes the proof of the entire lemma right here. Okay, so let me go back and see uh, how the lemma looks like. Okay, so we, we bounded the regret from above by the gap between the f t, the function values evaluated at, at two consecutive uh, uh, vectors, wt and wt plus one, right? So if these two, the, the differences uh, are small for every time step, then this would actually mean that the regret will be small, right? So the lemma shows that if the gap between the ft values at two consecutive vectors is small for all t, then this was this is this shows some something um like favorable for the performance of FTL. Okay. So I think I'm running out of time. So let me stop right here. So the, the regret of the FTL algorithm should be small if the two differences are small. So in other words, if your uh, the sequence of the vectors, the WT is stable. Um, then stability actually helps in showing small regret. So next, starting from next time, we'll see two examples. So one would be a online quadratic optimization. The other is online linear optimization. So in, in, the, in the quadratic case, we will see that the FTL is stable and linear case, there exists some example that the FTL is unstable, which leads to the failure of FTL. Okay, so I think I ran, up, I ran out of time. So I'll continue next time uh, with the, the analysis of FTL and we'll move on to the, another algorithm called the follow the regularized leader. And this will actually give rise to uh, other in interesting online learning algorithms called the uh, online gradient descent um, and online mirror descent. So I'll continue on next time. All right, I so think much. that's it for today. Yep, thank you. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, thank you very much. Uh, so we're seeing different style of lecturing, and I think this was a very effective one. It's uh, I think maybe even better than uh, how I'm uh, delivering my lecture. Anyhow, uh, online learning is a very very important, and it's used a lot commercially. Uh, one good example is clicking on the advertisements. And uh, if you know this, uh, if you know online learning very well, you start a company very easily. I mean, this is just a very easy way to start a company uh, this way. Okay, thank you very much. And I'll see, you'll, uh, see uh, Professor Yoon uh, uh, Thursday. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.